We're looking again in our Bible study at the letter of 1 Peter, 1 Peter chapter 3. And this was a letter written by uh, Peter, the follower and apostle, disciple of Jesus Christ, to a church. But it wasn't a church in one place, it was a church that had been scattered across the Roman Empire. And uh, instead of having the safety and security of the homeland of Jerusalem, uh, they were now really in many ways at the mercy of the uh, Roman Empire. They'd had to leave home because they'd become followers of Jesus Christ. And it had been at great cost that they followed Jesus Christ. And so he writes this letter to these aliens scattered right across the known world. And he's encouraging them and he's challenging them to stand strong and to be faithful. And in this letter we see that being worked out. And uh, in a day where increasingly, especially in the UK, it feels like we're at odds with the world around us. And uh, coming under increasing persecution, uh, though far from uh, anything that was felt by these uh, early Christians or by many people who own the name of Jesus Christ in this world. Now, as we, as we look at the Bible text from verse 13 of 1 Peter chapter 3, uh, there's a few, a few things that that really stand out, and uh, first of all is harm, and fear, and uh, you you get the idea with words like malicious and then suffering, and uh, you you get the idea that really these are people in the midst of of suffering, of very real suffering. But there are two words that appear here that I think are well worth considering. Uh, verse 16 a clear conscience and uh, this is this is a clear conscience so that you may speak uh, without any fear uh, any fear of being called a hypocrite or being caught out uh, without any of that kind of fear and then there's a that's a clear conscience in a way before man and then uh, verse 21. Is a clear conscience before God, a clear conscience before God, and uh, the conscience is an interesting. It's an interesting thing. The human being is told they have a conscience. It's an awareness deep within of right and wrong. It's not always perfect, uh, and it, it it can be deeply affected by sin. It can be deeply affected by the uh, the world around us. Our consciences are not as tender as we think they are but uh, we can see them but we can they're always there we can never remove them and so he talks about having a clear conscience a clear conscience uh, one of the issues that we're going to face in the next coming year few years uh, most probably is the question of uh, having a conscience and being able to act upon our conscience will we have to follow the conscience of the world and of those who are setting the agendas or will we be allowed to live by our own conscience will we be allowed to live by what we believe is right and wrong and not what the world holds to be right and wrong it's very interesting that the whole question of conscience arises now splitting it up uh, let me suggest there are a few ways to split it up uh, first of all there's a a testimony before the world in this first section and uh, and then the example of Christ in the second section uh, the example and work of Christ in the second section I'll just split it into two sections and deal first of all with this whole question of uh, fear and living in this world and then we'll deal with the example of Christ and the blessings of Christ that follow. And uh, I think that would be a, a good way to move forward. Now in looking at this, the, the, the first thing is, in general and overall, in general and overall, who will harm those who seek to do good? Who will harm those who seek to do good? And... Uh, that's a, that's a great question, isn't it? Who will harm you if you seek to do good? Uh, God won't harm you. 
Will your neighbours and friends harm you? Well, probably not if you're seeking to do good. So if you're eager and you're seeking to do good, you know you're, you're putting yourself in the right place. Uh, the, uh, earlier he had talked about how God has put in place governments uh, to punish the wrong and praise the right. Well, if you're seeking to do good, overall and in general, a government will not go against you, will not persecute you. Your neighbours and friends won't persecute you. But, but, there is a but, even if you should suffer for doing right, don't fear them. Don't fear them. Even if their suffering should come when you do right, don't fear them. Don't fear their threats. There's a Bible statement, isn't there? Do, do not worry about those who, who can affect the body, but be more concerned about God who can judge the soul. And so the most that anyone can do is to threaten you. The most anyone can do is to affect your physical body. And that can be a real great painful hardship. Um, but all they can do is your body, not your eternal soul. So don't be frightened. Don't fear. It says that. Don't. Don't be frightened. So quickly we're frightened and we're anxious. You know, Jesus says a lot about, do not worry about today. Today has trouble about tomorrow. Today has the troubles of its own. Let's seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Everything else will be added unto you. And he assures us that the evil will be ultimately be defeated. And he assures us that there is, for those who love him and follow him, and put their trust in him, a place of peace and joy forevermore. But Peter doesn't stop at that point. Peter goes on to give a lot more instructions. And uh, how can I how can I avoid being fearful? Well, in your hearts, give reverence to Christ as Lord. That that's a very simple one. Uh, recognize Christ as as Lord, as King, as ruler, and revere Him. Put yourself under His authority. We're going to come to it uh, towards the end. Uh, all angels, powers and authorities are under his feet. Get right with Jesus. Walk with Jesus. Trust him. Uh, it'll take away your fears. What can man do to you? It'll take away your fears. So... In your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. And then furthermore, don't be afraid, but be, be ready to give an answer to everyone who asks you the reason for the hope that you have. Now, there's an expectation here, uh, an expectation of questions. Questions because of faith. There's an expectation that as you live without fear, that people will ask, where is your hope? Where does your hope come from? But we're living at this present time uh, through a, a, a great trial in our country and across the world. A great fear, a fear of a of a virus, uh, a fear of a fear of the effect of a virus. And the Christian should be able to stand and and say, "Well, God is in control. I'm not going to be silly, but God is in control. He's in control of my life." And people would see that. People would see the hope you have and the faith you have, and would ask questions. That's the expectation. Then maybe there's a ruler and a governor and the governor is in, uh, imposing um, persecution upon the church. And yet the, the Christians are without fear and people say, well, why don't you fear? And there's, you'll be able to speak about the hope that is in you. Now, this is, again, only possible if you have a clear conscience. You know, hypocrisy kills testimony, doesn't it? That's a, a great saying. Hypocrisy kills testimony. And so, 
You should have a clear conscience and and keep everything right and keep right with God. And then when they they are malicious about you, well, when they stand before Christ, they'll be ashamed of their slander. Hey, a few thoughts. Pause and have a few thoughts. There are a couple of instructions here. The instructions lean heavily upon holiness of life, faith and obedience. So if a Christian isn't, uh, does not have holiness of life and faith and love and obedience, as has been described by Peter in the chapter that comes before, they won't be able to stand. They won't have a clear conscience. First of all, don't fear. Revere Christ. Always be ready to give an answer. Answer with gentleness and respect. Keep a clear conscience. Uh, we are to be like Christ. Uh, follow his example. But we're not going to be doing his work. And then, of course, Peter gets caught up with what Christ did. Uh, and so here he is, this lovely, these lovely statements. He suffered once for sins. His sacrifice. And though he was put to death in the body, he was made alive in the spirit. A sacrifice that was paid. So we could say, sacrifice paid. What a great work he did. Uh, he paid our sacrifice. He was willing to accept the unjust treatment of by human beings that he may he may do God's work, the work that God had set him to do. And, and in essence, that's what we're called to do. Uh, the work that is not his work, it's our work. And then he starts to be taken up with Christ and what Christ did. And uh, not only did he die, not only did he take away our sins, but he triumphed. So, so this verse 19 is a story of triumph. Triumph. After he made alive, he went and made proclamation to the imprisoned spirits, those who disobeyed God from long ago. There's all kinds of weird, so let me tell you, there's all kinds of very strange ways to understand this. But the, I think the most simple and most convincing is that as Jesus ascended in victory into heaven, uh, these these spirits who had been imprisoned, um, they saw it. They saw his triumph. They saw his triumph. Now, they were disobedient long ago when God waited uh, patiently. When Noah spent so many years building the ark, God waited patiently and they saw Noah building the ark. They heard of God's salvation. They heard him preach the hope of salvation and uh, calling them to abandon the wickedness, the great and terrible wickedness that covered the earth. Uh, and these spirits, these people had seen that. They had seen that, but they had rejected Christ. And when Christ arose in triumph, they bore witness to it. It was proclaimed to them. The Saviour had come. Not an ark, a boat. But a man, not someone you get, something you get into to escape, but someone you're bound with to escape. And they were disobedient. Only a few were saved. It's terribly sad. And then he talks about how the water symbolises baptism that saves you. Uh, now I'm, I'm going to not go with the water baptism idea, but being baptised into Christ. Uh, the washing and cleaning that he brings that is symbolised in physical water baptism but the greater baptism is that I'm united to Christ he cleanses me, he saves me he gives me a clear conscience towards God he gives me the hope of resurrection now Christ again is the example par excellence so we go through these simple principles. It is better to suffer if it's Christ's will for doing good than evil. That's simple. 
and uh, not hard to argue with. He died in the body, yet was made alive in the spirit, in speaking of Christ. He announced his victory to the imprisoned spirits who were disobedient long ago, who did not believe Noah and rejected the salvation promised. And now his work fulfills the symbol and promise of the ark and the cleansing of water. Our union with Christ. We are baptised into him. And his resurrection salvation saves us. And your saviour now reigns over the angels, authorities, powers. He reigns for you. So do not fear. How important it is to follow Jesus Christ, to put your trust in him and despite the situation in the world in which we live, to hold him as your king, as your God and as your hope. Lovely verses, lots to think about. Let me pray. Lord, thank you for every blessing you pour upon us. We ask that you would help us to follow you, to trust you and to live lives that bring glory and honour to your name. Amen.